you for giving me opportunity for uh, being the open opener in the lecture sessions. So today I'm supposed to speak on novel and new biomarkers for diabetic complications. Uh, yesterday I was looking at literature and then I saw a very good article on uh, on something which is important to me. So I wanted to introduce that particular publication to you which has a basis for biomarkers for diabetic complications. That means I have changed all my slides. I'm not going to present to you about uh, all those uh, adiponectin, fibronectin, plasminogen activator inhibitors, or macroglobulins, or uh, all that kind of things. So you might have heard about retinol binding protein, vitamin D binding protein. So a lot of things are coming into um, in literature, not into the practical application, but into the literature. But there is something which is coming into practical application also. So I'll have focus on that particular biomarker. But today's presentation is mostly the basis for uh, that biomarker. So if there are any biochemists in the audience, please excuse me. I'm not going to, uh, you're all biochemists, madam. Please excuse me, madam, I am not a biochemist. So my, lit my knowledge of biochemistry is only on the tip of my nose. So I don't understand much of biochemistry, but I have very good friends in biochemistry in India and abroad. So I have been taught orally by them. I don't read biochemistry, but I, I hear a lot of biochemistry. So today I am going to present to you something which is going to be a path breaking, path breaking in the field of pathobiology of diabetic complications. Please mark my words. It's something which is going to be a great, a great thing that is happening which you might not have heard, or some people might have heard, but for last 10 years, we are seeing a lot of literature about Glicknac. Pronunciation is Glicknac. Glicknac. You are aware of that, madam? Glicknac. So even I am also not aware. Only my friends have told me recently, so I started learning about this. But I am seeing excellent uh, papers with very good photographs in nature and all such big uh, so yesterday I came across a nice paper in JCB, uh, March 30th of this year. So I am presenting you that publication and it will give you the basis for entire new biomarkers for diabetic complication. Not only for diabetes, mind you the same thing also applies to Alzheimer's disease, many of the cancers, many neurodegenerative disorders, so a lot of things which are common between diabetes and most of the other uh, complications related to inflammation and uh, immunity. So please remember, I'm putting this slide just to make you familiar with three terms, glicnac, OGA, and OGT. OGA is nothing but glicnac, glicnac is, and OGT is glicnac transferase. So these three things are going to be the basis for most of the biological markers that are going to be available for practical application, I'm not talking about, just talking about something which is which we are, like macroglobulin, we have been hearing about beta-2 macroglobulin for alpha-2 macroglobulin for 25 years, but nothing happened. So, so many things will come and go, but uh, these things are going to stay. So please apply your wisdom, try to understand. I don't understand most of it, but as a clinician, as a physician who are doing the routine OP work, Whatever I understood, I am trying to present to you and make you familiar with whatever I understood. Please remember that inside the cell, there is something going on for protein cycling. All proteins are broken down into amino acid or something else and then reconstituted. So protein synthesis as well as protein breakdown uh, is happening inside the cell. Protein breakdown is more important than protein synthesis. If you have uninhibited protein breakdown, you have a lot of mutagenesis. You understand? You are all able to understand. So protein breakdown, protein cycling is as important or more important than synthesis. The first step in protein cycling is a conjugation process. Anything has to be conjugated, all of us know about we heard about conjugation of um, hemoglobin or uh, chemicals, all chemicals before they enter into the liver. So conjugation is a process body uses for 
making some material adaptable for degradation either in the liver or kidney or anywhere inside the cell. So intracellularly, we have protein breakdown and that particular thing is called post-translational modification. That means intracellularly, all proteins have to be modified before they are recycled. So most importantly, all of us have been hearing about phosphorylation. All of us have been hearing about phosphorylation is one of the, one of the conjugation. Glycosylation is also a conjugation. This glycnac or N-acetylation is also another conjugation. So a cross-link or a cross-talk between these two things is constituting about two-thirds, or at least let us say 60% of entire human body's proteins. The first step in recycling is a cross-talk between N-acetylation and phosphorylation. I am telling all these things without really understanding the meaning, so don't bother. I am a physician. You are all, most of you are physicians. But the whatever little you have to remember, like what my Professor Moses used to say, you just remember the word, the title. Don't bother what it is. No? Just remember the terms, N-acetylation, phosphorylation, crosstalk, like that. Like that I am also telling you. But this is what you have to learn. Crosstalk between N-acetylation and phosphorylation constitutes the first step Abundant, abundant first step intracellularly for protein cycling. So every protein, protein means all enzymes, all vitamins, all hormones, everything. Everything in human body is regulated or modified with protein. So please just think about it. Is sugar important or protein important? Is carbohydrate important or protein important? Both are important, but which one? All of you say carbohydrate, but my say protein. My boss said protein. My boss said protein in 1960s. My boss is Professor MMS Ahuja. So in definition of diabetes, he has mentioned it is a metabolic disorder involving carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Why are you talking about only carbohydrate and not about protein? You are talking about fat because cardiologists are interested in fat. You are interested in carbohydrate, but you all forget about protein. But protein is a vitamin, protein is hormone, protein is enzyme. At every step you have proteins. So unless you talk about proteins, unless you think about proteins, unless you know about proteins, you will not be able to do justification for diabetes patient. Ultimately it all boils down to your clinical management of diabetes. So that's why I'm trying to today impress upon you that something that is happening in diabetes in human body, which is uh, required for our, for our understanding, of diabetic complication, which we have been ignoring all these years. So all those things, if you can read, you read it, otherwise don't bother. But basically, I'm trying to say that this, uh, this uh, uh, glycnac, glycnacase, glycnac transferase are three important bases for many of the diseases in the human body. This is the publication on March 30th in JCB. So, Glycnac modifications happen intranuclearly also, internucleus also, inside the nucleus also a lot of things are happening related to glycnac. So that slide tells you that. And once that glycnac uh, modifications are uh, done inside the nucleus, it also has some effect on the mitochondria as well as intracellularly in endoplasmic reticulum. That's enough. We don't have to understand too much. So inside the nucleus, intracellularly, Inside the mitochondria, mitochondria means a lot of phosphorylation happens there. Mitochondria, outside mitochondria, intercellularly, a lot of things are happening which are related to glycnac or N-acetylation or one of the conjugation processes for protein breakdown. So intercellularly, intracellularly. I am re repeatedly saying intracellular. So intracellularly, whatever is happening, I'll, I'll, I'll show you this slide in a better, uh, better, uh, format in uh, subsequent slides, but remember whatever is happening intracellularly, he has a direct relation to many of the clinical conditions we are, sorry, sorry, many of the clinical conditions we are dealing with. So all these clinical conditions, MODI, SA MODI, NIDDM, cancer, lupus, so many things. Most of them are inter interesting to us for our clinical management. So a lot of things are related to glycnac.
So you always talk about hyperglycemia being the sole and the only and the most important and the best and worst or whatever in diabetes. You don't talk about anything else. So every organ is uh, dependent on hyperglycemia. That is not true. Never in history, never in literature, never in any long-term studies, there have been any single blood sugar value. Uh, that means a threshold for fasting or post has been related to diabetic complications. You can argue when I come outside, everybody will shout at me. But just uh, look at the literature. Which blood sugar is uh, bad for diabetes? Is there any threshold for fasting or post -vandal? Did they give any blood sugar value anywhere in the literature? No. They are always talking about hemoglobin A1C of 7%. They don't talk about fasting this much or post this much being related to any of the microvascular or macrovascular. No. Look at the uh, CGMS data of the best diabetic in my practice. Maybe I am bad, but at least my patients who uh, I consider best, the person who eats same food, same time, same day, same time, everything, every exercise, same time, everything perfect. So that man has this kind of CGMS. He has two hypoglycemias every day. He has several hypoglycemias every day. His hemoglobin A1C is 7.5. But in spite of that, you see that is why right. that's how the best diabetic has his blood sugars. So if you take a blood sugar at this time, you will think that this fellow has got more blood sugar, so you increase the dose. Suppose you take blood sugar at this time, you say no, no, it's hypoglycemia reduced. So in a single day, you will have different ideas about treatment of diabetes. So if you depend on blood glucose, you are lost. So there's something which is coming in future, not future, near future, that we have to either do SMBG or, or at least home monitoring of blood glucose for six uh, times a day, or you go for glycated albumin, 1,5-anhydroglucetol is coming up in a very big way. Of course, we know that this is important. All national guidelines, America, Australia, British, India, or whatever, all countries have abundant blood sugar. They are only talking about 7% hemoglobin A1C. They don't talk about 120 or 200. Yes or no? You all know about it. That means the relevance of blood glucose is being brought down in last 100 years. So it's not going to be the same hereafter. So you have to put more emphasis on glycated hemoglobin. But that means you have to wait for 90 days before you change the prescription of your patient in your clinic. Are you going to change? your prescription once in 90 days or you want to do it something in between. So for in between, you have these things. Today I'm going to talk about glycosylation. I'm not going to talk much about the biomarker, but about glycosylation. All the remaining are glycation. Glycation and glycosylation, another take home message. Glycation is non-enzymatic, non-insulin dependent, non-reversible non-enzymatic, non-reversible, non, uh, so three points, non-enzymatic, non-reversible, non-insulin dependent, glucose binding to the amino acid moiety is glycation. Glycation of the albumin, fructose amine, glycated albumin, or, uh, or uh, glycated hemoglobin belong to this category. They are not really reflecting pathobiology in diabetic complication. Can you explain biochemically most of the complications with any of the glycation, no. But glycosylation is, is enzymatic, intracellular, directly related to the pathobiology of diabetic complication. So glycosylation is what I am going to speak to you. Glycosylation has this n acetylation, that is that glicnac, what I was mentioning. N acetylation from nucleus, from endoplasmic reticulum, coming either intracellular or extracellular and binding to the glycons. These are the glycons. So suppose if you measure these glycons, it is a surrogate marker for glycnac or glycnacase or glycnac transferase. So we have today indirect biomarkers for measuring the activity of N acetylation and thereby to identify somebody who is going to become diabetic or somebody who is going to get diabetic complications. Now there are clinical references on glycnac versus impending diabetic retinopathy, impending coronary artery disease, impending diabetes. So for both diabetes and diabetic complications, you need to have biomarkers which will tell you about N acetylation or glycosylation in our terms. 
which is what we understand, glycosylation, not glycation. So, glycosylation has direct relation or N-acetylation has direct relation with insulin resistance. It also has got a direct relation to several of the complications that are occurring in diabetes, either in the kidney or in the retinal capillaries or in myocardium or in the uh, vascular structures. So this slide, I will keep it for about few minutes. Please remember this uh, glicknack, what I was mentioning, our uh, O-linked uh, N installation is what is going to uh, be explained in this particular slide. So that glicknack has contribution from glucose metabolism, about 2 to 3 percent of the glycolysis from this glycolysis that, uh, that is shunted into the alternate pathway, that is hexose, that is otherwise called hexosamine biosynthetic pathway. So the, at, the, at the first step of the glycolysis itself, you have some contribution to glicknack. Then from glutamine, from amino acid, you have some more contribution. So the N, N part comes from amino acid at this stage. And then fatty acids contribute acetylation. So the glucose, amine, acetylation. Then there's also contribution from nucleus, nucleotides. So ultimately it is called UDP glicnac. So it has direct reflection of what is happening in carbohydrate, in protein, in fat metabolism. So glicnac or the other, other, uh, other uh, uh, indirect measure of glycosylation is going to tell you about three important components or constituents of diabetes pathology. You are not just confining yourself to glucose. You, have to th you are not confining yourself to fat. You always talk about lipoproteins and you know, all lipoproteins and all peroxidases and all that kind of things. But you have something which is very important, the abundant conjugation, abundant glycosylation, intracellular, enzymatic, directly related to the pathobiology of diabetic complication is glicnac. So anything that gives you a measure of glicnac or glicnacase or glicnac transferase is the real biomarker in diabetes hereafter. So a, a glycosylated protein looks like this. A non-glycosylated, glycosylated proteins has glycons. These are the glycons, most, uh, and they are very easy to measure. And uh, we have actually invented measures to uh, measure these things in blood, in saliva. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but basically I'm just giving you an idea, basis for this kind of tests which are coming to be uh, available in market for translational research. I'm not talking about theoretical research that has been available in the literature for the last 30 years. But uh, this uh, glicnac measures by indirect uh, measurements either in the blood or saliva are also dynamic. Glycated hemoglobin is not dynamic. Once it is 7%, it is over. Or 8%, it is over. It will not come down. It may go up. It will not come down. That means somebody who is in hypoglycemia for last uh, 15 days with you may have a hemoglobin A1C of 9%. You may not really know what is really happening. It's not a dynamic thing. It's only upward, upward uh, kinetics of glyco glucose binding to the amino acid. So glycosylation doesn't give you, sorry, glycation doesn't give you the real picture of what is happening to glucose in your patient. Here you have that kind of a dynamic. So glycosylation actually upwards or downwards, it, it can change depending on your therapeutic intervention. So you need to have more and more glycosylated proteins as biomarkers for identifying diabetes, for monitoring diabetes, for predicting diabetes, for predicting a complication. It's also possible to have glycoproteomes in saliva, in urine, in blood, in, uh, in measurable concentrations, and they're also comparable. So whatever you see in blood can also be seen in urine, can also be seen in saliva, can also be seen in many other proteins, in many other biological secretions. So that is, that's what we see here. Yes, we have published on salivary. We're also coming up with a point of care device to measure some of these glycons so that they'll give an indirect measure of N acetylation. So we also made nomogram. Uh, I'm not going too much into the actual product, but these are the take home messages. Please remember, you may fire on me after coming out of this uh, stage, but remember, blood glucose has no value in diabetes. I'm very boldly, I'm saying. <laughs> My boss told me, my boss told this written in textbooks in 1960s. 
I have not invented. Where is the evidence that blood glucose has a relation with any of the complications? BTCCT or UKPDS has never given you any value of blood glucose. They'll talk about only hemoglobin A1C or glycated hemoglobin, which is also a non-specific, non-dynamic, okay, rough measure of a complication or rough measure of a diabetes once in 90 days. So what happens in between is that we have to wait for 90 days. So take home message, microvascular complication may result from chronic uh, uh, sustained hyperglycemia, but the excursions are more important. You know about that, a lot of lectures are happening. Glycation, yes, I told glycation of hemoglobin, even say glycation of the proteins of fructose is not pathobiological, whereas glycosylation is enzymatic, intercellular, it is pathobiological. So hexose uh, pathway, Exosomine biosynthetic pathway is the key for diabetes and most of the diabetic complications. So GLICNAC, it's a nice thing to remember, GLICNAC. Yeah, I was always wondering how to pronounce GLC, NAC, but uh, my American biochemist friends told me GLICNAC. So it's nice to pronounce GLICNAC. GLC, NAC, N-estylation. So that is going to be the basis for the all biomarkers and diabetic complications in future. Right? Thank you, sir.